Bill Ludlow, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup all the way from Arizona. You're a member of the Geological Society of America and the Southwest Paleontological Society, and you're a volunteer at the Origins Gallery of the Arizona Museum of Natural History. So uh, how have you been doing since our Talk Beliefs interview, Bill? You spent a few days uh, recently on an early Permian paleo dig, I hear. I did, yeah, yeah. Things have been going great. My YouTube channel's really been taking off lately. Um, yeah, I have a, the Creation Science Fiction website uh, talking about creationism, but I also have been doing a lot of stuff on paleontology. Like you said, I've got a, a video in the works on ge geology. In fact, we're filming some drone footage of a geological formation here in Arizona tomorrow. Wow. So that's kind of exciting. Uh, and um, but yeah, creationsciencefiction.com is my website been busy in the field. I've been working with the New Mexico Museum of Natural History because mm -hmm. the curator of paleontology there is a national expert on, on tracks, Permian footprints. And so I uh, went on a paleo dig with them a couple weeks ago. We found five different types of tracks. Um, we also you found, always seem to be finding you know, tracks, Bill. <laughs> yeah, well, we're kind of looking for them. Now, I stumbled yeah. on the first set. Um, in fact, that initial find that I talked with you about, I think the last yeah, time. Yeah, Coconino um, Sandstone. Right. I'm up to yeah. 94 sets of tracks in one area, um, about, a, about a third of a mile on a local lake. Uh, we've documented 94 sets of tracks. Uh, the paper on that will be coming out this summer, the initial paper. And we're working on an abstract on the recent one. Um, we found actually even a, a hand-sized uh, footprint of an amphibian with it had skin imprints on the palm, which is really rare. So that was neat as well as we found stuff that talk, talk, told us about the environment, fern fossils, conifer fossils, things like that. It was a freshwater environment, kind of a swamp. And um, I did a video about that recently. I said, we're working on an abstract for a poster presentation. If we get it done in time and get it approved, I'll be doing that at the Geological Society of America National Convention here in Phoenix this fall in September. So, And an abstract is, for anyone who doesn't know, it's like a summary, isn't it, of a paper? That Correct. We yeah. And, you know, more lengthy. Right. And for presentations, we have to submit an abstract in advance and get it approved. And then we actually give the, the full presentation at the meeting. So today, Bill, we're going to be discussing the latest finds in the world of human origins, how it affects the current state of paleoanthropology and, of course, your own personal take on things. I think a good place to start is the discovery of a new species of human out there in the Philippines, Homo luzonensis. So What's the story of this discovery, and what do we know about this new species? Well, you know, we actually know very little. Human origins is my favorite topic, though, and I'm always down to talk about that, that's for sure. So, yeah, um, you, you know, the honest answer is we, we just don't know an awful lot. So far, they found some hand and foot bones, uh, a thigh bone, and seven teeth. So we don't really have an overall picture of the anatomy of this species. Um, it's definitely something new, though. Uh, but no skull, cranial remains have been found um, yeah. you know, other than teeth. The fossils are dated uh, 50,000 to 67,000 years ago. So, you know, it's something that was alive in the Philippines, in that area, uh, at the same time as Homo floresiensis. So it's been compared to Homo yeah. floresiensis quite a bit. Um, Which was the yeah, hobbit, of course. Exactly, right. Yes. Um, you know, they, uh, it, in like The Hobbit, it shows a mixture of archaic and more modern traits, too. So that's what's interesting. You know, a lot of interesting things about this. One of the foot bones was actually discovered back in 2010, um, but it was thought to be a smaller member of our species. Um, the remaining fossils were actually discovered between 2011 and 2015. But, of course, you know, they, they were studying them. They wanted to come up with uh, more information as much as they could before it was really published. So one of the, another one of the foot bones that they found close, more closely remembers Australopithecus than genus mm -hmm. Homo. So that's another interesting thing. Uh, it's just a real mixture of, of features. Um, so you don't a think lot it's an offshoot of Homo erectus, like is what they're thinking with uh, the Hobbit? 
Well, you know, that's kind of been set aside, at least by most people. Uh, there was a 2017 study by the Australian National University. Um, they concluded that Floresiensis probably had a, uh, an ancestor. Again, we're talking Floresiensis, not Lusinensis here now. Um, but had probably had a common ancestor with Homo habilis or something very similar to Homo habilis over a million years ago in Africa. They compared 133 different data points. I mean, pretty much the entire anatomy that we know about both of those species and determined that there were traits that Floresiensis had in common with Habilis that were continued on and were lost in species like, say, Homo erectus. So evolution doesn't really go in reverse. So if, if you go along and you're losing traits, you don't suddenly gain them back again at some point. Um, you know, there could be that they could evolve something similar, but I mean, that's just not what we see. We see that basically there are traits in Floresiensis that are shared with Habs and uh, we don't see it in other species like Erectus. So rather than a dwarf version of Erectus, it's more likely that something left Africa over a million years ago, uh, we start seeing the fossils um, dated at about 700,000 years ago with Floresiensis, the evidence for it, and that it remained genetically and geographically isolated from other hominins in the area and just evolved in a different direction while retaining a lot of those earlier traits. So I suppose uh, we don't really know how that group could have got to the islands in the same ways. We're not quite sure how Florensians has got to the Flores Islands. Right. But we know, I mean, we do associate them with tool use. We, you know, so, I mean, there's, there was cognitive abilities there. Um, you know, we don't even know how Homo erectus got to some of the islands because Homo erectus has been, you know, in the Philippines or in the, in Indonesia, I should say, mm. for uh, well, a million and a half or more years where it's there. So it could be that they were expert rafters. We have no idea. It, it isn't that difficult to lash together some things and, and you know, and some wood and, and get from one point to the other. So um, could it be that the landscape was different or is it too early for it to have been radically different? You know, 50,000 to 100,000 years ago, it wasn't that radically different probably than, than it, would, it would have been now. So um, there were times, of course, when the water was much lower um, during the Ice Age, then you know, than it, than it is now, probably a bit different than what we see, but but not radically. You know. Getting back again to Lusinensis, you know, a lot of paleoanthropologists are skeptical. Uh, they're skeptical of the designation Homo. John Hawkes made the quote. Uh, you know, a quote is quoted as saying, I wish there were more bones. And, and that's really the, where it ends up. I mean, there's not a lot of evidence there um, to really know exactly what it looked like. We don't have any evidence of, the, of its you know, size, of its cranial capacity. You know, cranial capacity, bipedalism, and tool use used to be the criteria for designating genus Homo. And still sort of is, but, you know, way back in the mid 1900s i mean they talked about a cranial capacity of 750 cc's would have been the minimum so homo habilis snuck in there on, on some of those early homo habilis but you know now we, we're looking at a cranial capacity of i think it's around 417 425 cc's for homo floresiensis so that we've no, thrown out the cranial capacity because we see evidence of tool use and we see evidence of bipedalism um with lusinensis though the only evidence of possible tool use is a deer bone with cut marks that might be cut marks on it found in the same layer as one of the foot bones. We don't have any actual stone tools that are associated with the fossils. There's evidence of stone tools going back 700,000 years in the region, um, along with butchered rhino skeleton, but it's not associated with fossils from Homo lusinensis. There's no uh, hominin fossils associated in those layers. So, you know, they're speculating. Um, and to designate it as genus Homo, it's, it's, it's a reach. Given the few foot bones, the fact that it's slightly smaller than the hobbit, uh, we don't have as much evidence that it was actually committed to walking fully upright. I'm kind of surprised nobody's nicknamed it Gollum. 
<laughs> <laughs> that would be the next yeah. logical step, wouldn't it? Do you think right. they jumped the gun a little bit with these these uh, designations of genus? Well, I had an interesting conversation about a month ago. I've been lucky enough now to be invited a couple times. In fact, I have mutual friends with this person who are musicians in the area. And her name is uh, Friedrin Ankel Simons. And her husband, Elwyn Simons, they taught at Duke University. Friedrin is an amazing woman. She's in her 80s now. She wrote the book Primate Anatomy, which is still in use. It's in its third edition. Uh, they did a lot of studies in Madagascar and Eastern Af Africa and early primate evolution and, and modern primates. She was actually personal friends with Mary Leakey um, wow. and, 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 you know, uh, stayed with them at Old of Gorge at times and, and just lots of great stories from her on, on all these things that have happened down there and that, you know, different things that went on back, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And, and, um, but anyway, I asked her, you know, and I asked her, what did she think of this new find? And she almost didn't want to talk about it. She just said, Everybody wants to find something in the genus Homo, you know, um, and assign and, a name to it. And assign genus Homo, and and also it was just like the race with the Leakeys and Johansson and those guys back in you know last century, where everybody wanted to find the earliest genus Homo. So, um, you know, whether or not this is going to remain in our genus or not, as more fossils are found, is is up for question. Um, you know, it's, I think, uh, personally, I think it's really pushing it to assign it to genus homo with so few remains and really, uh, no concrete ev evidence that it used tools and, and, and the d small, well, we assume a small cranial capacity, unless it was a three foot, you know, uh, hominin with a huge head. So, <laughs> Yeah. Well, if if new uh, finds are discovered, new bones are discovered, which they probably will be, um, the good thing about science is that they'll say, okay, we were wrong about this, and now we're going to reclassify. There's a rush now there to go back and look at some of these previous sites because we had uh, found a lot of evidence for Homo erectus in in the areas. In fact, some of the more most recent, you know, um, I shouldn't say recent or more, uh, the le least old uh, um, in, in age Homo erectus has been found down in Indonesia there, but they would stop digging when they got to certain layers, you know, just because they hadn't found anything previously in older layers and other layers. So um, read an article about that. So I think we're going to see a lot more digging, uh, a lot digging deeper into the area and, and coming up with some new fossils. And of course, what often happens, as you know, is somebody is uh, dusting off some old finds in a drawer in a museum and uh, there's something there that they think oh hang on this might be this new species that was just found. well Could that happen. leads us that leads us into our next topic we it were talking does. about discussing doesn't it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah excellent well it doesn't seem that long ago that that uh, scientists stumbled upon a new species that was probably more surprising even than uh homo luzonensis i'm uh, of course talking about the denisovans or dennis hovens or however you want to pronounce it either um, way yeah <laughs> i say Denis denisovans but it was a uh, a tiny finger bone found in a cave in siberia that was uh dna sequenced and turned out to be a totally new species genetically distinct from the hominids in the area at the time namely modern humans and neanderthals but this year 2019 another denisovan fossil was found and this was a pretty fascinating discovery wasn't it particularly the way it was found well it is because it was actually found back in 1980 by a Buddhist monk, um, and and somebody was going through drawers and looking at things, and you know, and and just decided to take a second look at it. And I expect we're going to find a lot more of this as uh, we take fossils that have previously been found and test them for DNA or proteins that can help identify the species. So again, it was it was uh, originally just, uh, found in 1980 by a Buddhist monk. Um, Many of the fossils originally found in the, the um, Denisovan cave there were actually found in the 1970s. It wasn't until the Max Planck Institute uh, tested them for DNA that they were assigned to a new species. So the initial find of the Denisovans uh, or Denisovans um, 
actually was on previously found fossils too. So um, other ones that they tested in the, uh, the cave there, the original cave, turned out to be Neanderthals. So we know that it was occupied either at different times or possibly simultaneously with uh, evidence of a hybrid, uh, first generation hybrid that they found between the Denisovans and the, the Neanderthals. So um, one of the neat uh, things about this find, though, is that uh, it's possible that early hominins like the Denisovans were already adapted to living in higher altitudes uh, before modern humans arrived in Tibet. So um, modern humans show a trace of a specific gene or show a specific gene that is uh, it prevents excess hemoglobin in, in the blood. And so it, it allows people to live healthier at higher latitudes or higher altitudes. And um, this is also traced back to Denisovans. So it looks like there was probably some interbreeding going on with early humans that arrived in the area that allowed them to continue to stay and, and live at high altitudes in, in Tibet. Which we see, of course, if you, uh, I know there's been a few documentaries about this where uh, they go up there and there are these, uh, these people living quite simply, but you have old men sort of like quite happily carrying heavy loads and they're not out of breath. Right. And, yeah. and of course, they tested and found out that they've got this, this uh, I, I don't know, would you call it a mutation or just a adaptation or what would you call it? Well, I think originally it was probably, a, um, you know, not a beneficial mutation. It may have been um, one of those benign or just dormant mutations, you know, but, but then as the people who had it were in, became into that area, it natural selection takes over and and the people that have that ability are going to be healthier so eventually it's it, it you know spreads throughout the whole population the new find for this that what we're talking about is a partial mandible i believe is that right right um there's a quote i got a quote here from the new york times it says in 2010 Dongju Zhang, an archaeologist with the lanzhou university in china began studying the tibetan jaw um, which had been languishing in storage at her institution. So right away she could tell it was human-like but not human. Now, I got an issue with that. I've just got to correct. It was human. It just wasn't our species of human. <laughs> you know, yeah. so many people will relate the word human to Homo sapiens only, where anything really in the genus Homo is, is going to be human, but it wasn't Homo sapiens for sure. Um, she says, we all have chins, but this doesn't have a chin. So it, it looked more like Neanderthal to her. So this is the first hint that we have that Denisovans may have looked more like or had traits that are, um, you know, that they share with Neanderthals. They were pretty chinless and foreheadless. The, uh, right, <laughs> right. You know, the traditional Neanderthal has either, depending on how you're going to define chin, either no chin or a very receding chin. Um, compared to Homo sapiens. Again, this is the first anatomical hint we have because all we had previously, they were up to, I believe, three teeth and uh, part of a pinky bone. So we didn't have anything. Oh, and then they found this small piece of skull recently too. Um, but it was a, a small piece. I mean, we don't have a cranial shape. We don't have anything. We have no um, idea of postcranial anatomy at all. But hopefully that'll change as they test other bones. You know, the thing was is that they weren't able to extract intact DNA from this to match. I was, gonna, I was just going to ask that: Is Fante Pabo getting on with it and you know doing it again, or or not? Right. Well, what they were able to do is extract proteins, and and so proteins, certain proteins or some proteins can live on. Um, uh, they can be preserved more easily than the D, complete DNA. But these proteins match specific proteins with the Denisovans. So that's that's how they were able to you know match it up and say that we know that this this is a uh, this species. Yep. Is this a new thing? This protein testing? It is. It really is. Yeah, comparatively to um, DNA testing and and everything else, absolutely. As, as the technology advances, we may be able to use that on on other existing fossils. And again, I think there's going to be a rush to go through a lot of these fossils. Um, that have been previously discovered, especially in Asia, Asia, and um, you know, test them for proteins or DNA, and see if we can link it up with possibly these archaic humans that we believe were alive. Um, you know, another offshoot of Homo erectus that kind of went in a different direction. Um, there's yet an undiscovered 
uh, fossils for a, another population that we know that lived in Asia as recently as 50 to 100,000 years ago, we see the, their um, imprint on genomes there in Asians today, just like we see Denisovan and Neanderthals. But we see that there's a genetically other distinct population that contributed to these modern Asian genomes, but we have no fossils for that yet at all. Yes, I remember so. hearing something about this, this mystery race, you know. So right. uh, I wonder how many more we're going to find. You know? <laughs> Can you yeah. imagine? Yeah, you know, looking at the overall genome, I mean, it, probably not too many more, but it looks like there was at least this one out there. Now, people speculated it might be Homo forestiensis, but I don't think so. I think it's just too different. I think it's too, and I think they were geographically isolated So. You know, um, but but who knows? I mean, there were, we were interbreeding with something else out there. So <laughs> no, we, were, we were very busy yep. in those days. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, Bill, in 2010, the paleoanthropology world was rocked by the discovery in South Africa of a new species of Australopithecus. This was named Australopithecus sediba, two million years old, discovered by the burger, or rather by his nine-year-old son, which quickly became a contender for the so-called missing link between the ape-like Australopithecus and the human-like Homo genus. But in January of this year, scientists concluded that Sedibo is distinct from other lineages, effectively removing the species as a likely human ancestor. So were you surprised by this, Bill? Can you see why this has happened? Not really surprised at all. Um... You know, the species has always been in doubt as a direct human ancestor. I met Lee Berger. I like Lee Berger. Um, he, is, he has always kind of pushed, you know, towards, you know, the South Africa, putting South Africa forward as far as uh, in being involved in human evolution for modern it was, always, it was always East Africa before that, and, of course, Chad a bit with the uh, Salanthropus, but uh, never South Africa. Well, you know, there are gaps in the, the fossil record in East Africa that are filled with, with hominins from South Africa. I mean, when you look at um, Australopithecus afarensis and then, um, you know, Australopithecus africanus down in South Africa. Um, but I think what was going on um, is there were just, there were hominins all throughout Africa. And, and we just haven't discovered a lot of those fossils yet. Um, you know, Lee Berger has strongly suggested in the past that it was possible Sediba has always faced the issue that the fossils are dated slightly less than 2 million years old. And we have evidence of genus Homo in East Africa at 500,000 years older than that or more. So um, there's the problem there. We've got genus Homo already in East Africa. We got Sediba at, at you know, 500,000 years younger. There's, there's a problem for Sediba. It hasn't been booted from our family tree. It's just been booted from a direct line of ancestry to, to genus Homo, modern humans. So it uh, just moved to a branch that didn't maybe directly lead to us. It doesn't really diminish the importance of the find um, because it's one of these important finds that tells us that there was a lot of diversity at any one time. You know, 30, 40 years ago, they were teaching that it was a, a direct ladder-like, you know, step-by-step uh, yeah. evolution from one species to another. Now we know that that's not true. They taught that because that's what we only had so many fossils. Um, now we know that there was a lot of diversity at any given time and um, that, you know, a lot of uh, different species or, or close to related species went into making the next level, the next, you know, there would be, uh, they could have gotten, you know, different attributes or, or advanta advantageous attributes from other uh, crossbreeding, hybridization, that kind of thing too. So Southern Africa is a great example of endemism where what we see um, going on with Sediba and Homo naledi compared to things that we see going on in East Africa at the same time, we say, see that same type of thing with today or in recent history with, let's say, zebras. You know, the South African version, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's now extinct. Um, but it was slightly different than the version that was, you know, still alive in, in East Africa. Um, wildebeest. We've got um, the uh, blue wildebeest in East Africa and the black wildebeest in South Africa. They're slightly different, 
closely related. You can tell they have a common ancestor, but consider different species. Same thing is with gazelles, and there's a lot of different types of gazelles, but we see distinct species of gazelles in southern Africa that are different from uh, central and eastern Africa. So what you've got is there were periods of time, and, and this was discussed um, at length by Stephen Churchill from Duke University. Um, I, I saw a lecture of his where he discussed this at length, where he talked about there were a lot of times where there was changing environment in the, the areas in between South and East Africa. Um, those changes in environment, heavy forestation, things like that, would have genetically and geographically isolated the populations at times. Then there were other times where it was maybe more open grasslands and they were able to intermingle. So what you've got is this environment going back and forth in different areas, uh, cutting them off geographically and genetically, and then they were able to come back together at times. So you have this in the evolution going in different directions slightly in South Africa than you did in East Africa. And I think that's what we saw with Australopithecus, where you've got Afarensis, you've got, you know, in East Africa, you've got um, Africanus in South Africa, and some members of Africanus went their own way and ended up becoming Sediba, and possibly some of those ended up evolving into Homo naledi, which is much more recent at two to 300,000 years old. Do we know anything about Homo naledi? Because, of course, Lee Berger discovered that as well, like a couple of years later, which, he, you know, he must have been beside himself. Um, but right. do we think now that uh, naledi is linked to, uh, to to our ancestry at all? No, I think it's an offshoot. I mean, we had, you know, anatomically modern humans um, by the time that, these Homo naledi fossils are dated. And the, and when you look at them, they are half ape. I mean, they are, well, we're all apes. But, I mean, from the waist up, they show a small head, uh, small shoulder, or narrow shoulders, long arms compared to the legs, curved fingers, permanently curved finger bones, uh, which are still adaptations to arboreal or living or moving around in trees. Um, we don't see that with other members of of genus Homo at the time, um, you know, two to three hundred thousand years ago, when these fossils were dated, we had six, seven, maybe eight different, depending on if you're a lumper or a splitter, different species of humans alive at the same time throughout Europe, yeah. Africa, Asia, and and uh, you know, but you know, Naledi seems to be an offshoot that that went in one direction and died out. So. Um, was it you know, just, it was just, would you call it just barely genus Homo, or was it just a, a mosaic of features of both? No evidence of tool use yet with Naledi. Homo Naledi may end up becoming reclassified as a different genus as we find more fossils in South Africa that show or don't show a connection to early Australopithecines there. So. All right. Okay. Well, that was really fascinating as always, Bill. Thank you so much. And I'm sure this won't be the end of the new discoveries, as I've said, in the world of human origins. Uh, there'll no doubt be more. And I hope you can come back onto Evolution, yeah. Evolution Zoop and review them for us. All right. And good luck with your new channel. Um, as I said, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i mirror this on my channel and, and put a link into your channel. Um, you know, I think what you're doing is awesome. I've watched some of your videos. Your interviews are, are excellent. So... Oh, thank you. That's an honor to hear that from you, Bill. Thank you so much indeed. And I'll put uh, links to your social media and Facebook pages in the description below. And of course, if anyone wants to come and say hi and talk paleo stuff with you, they can find you at the Origins Gallery of the Arizona Museum of Natural History. So, Bill Ludlow, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>